Hello singers, uh, I am Gabriel Wiener and uh, you can find me on contemporaryvoicelessons.com and today I have the great honor, privilege and pleasure of having uh, Mark Baxter who you can find on voicelesson.com and today we are going to have a little conversation about uh, ethnocentric uh, differences between uh, Afrocentric singing and Eurocentric singing. So um, what that means is, is that we're going to talk about two broad categories that singing comes from. And so I think I asked Mark to do this because I think it's a very important uh, conversation for us singers to understand. And um, I wanted to start, Mark, with uh, thanking you for agreeing to do this. My pleasure. And um, I just wanted to say a little story about how I got into singing and uh, how I got to be a voice teacher and all that stuff. And then maybe I could hear your equivalent of that and just short briefly, and then we can talk about um, these differences. Sure. Or similarities. Why not? So um, I grew up in the Dominican Republic, and most of the singing that I was exposed to there was the folklore local singing with the genres that were more Afrocentric because it's uh, the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And um, I grew up in a more suburban area with, you know, uh, in, in, a, in a neighborhood that listened more to, like I said, our folk music. So there was bachata, which is our folk music, merengue, salsa, which also comes from Puerto Rico. And it was very rhythmic. And most of the singers and musicians that played this stuff, I grew up in front of a club. So it was, it was music constantly playing. That's great. <laughs> yeah. And um, well, it, it's great now in hindsight, but back then I, it was hard to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so um, we, uh, yes, I, 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 we listened to that. And in hindsight, I know that most of those uh, singers and musicians did not read music and uh, they were just playing more by ear. And uh, they were also just going by a feel and just kind of trying to get the crowd going. So then I fell in love with, with singing on the radio, which was also more of that, because that was what you know Dominicans took more to. We didn't listen to opera or classical music so much there. It wasn't part of our culture too much. Mm -hmm. My only image of opera singers were that they were like really big people that made funny sounds and so i had that kind of prejudice and just i thought it was silly uh, so then i came to the states and i wanted to be a singing superstar and i went to a college for singing and um when i was asked to audition with a song i sang with a very raspy voice which was what i grew up listening to and i liked because it moved me breathy raspy and this was a uh, musical theater program. So they were not too thrilled back in those days with those sounds. And mm -hmm. so I remember that person auditioning me was cringing as I was singing. And <laughs> I was not used to that response. <laughs> uh, I was used to saying, oh, you, you sound great or whatever, at least back home. Um, so then, you know, long story short, I, I got to turned down. They said, no, you can't come here. You have to go to a community college, learn how to read music. And to which I said, that's the point. That's why I want to come here. So they, they didn't accept me into the music and singing program. And on my way out, I saw a poster saying, you know, you can audition for acting and theater, learn two monologues. The deadline is tomorrow. So I, I went, learned two overnight got in and then I kind of worked my way into the music program by you know doing acting and converging it with musical theater and then it's a huge story but anyway I, here I am and I started teaching when I graduated college and it's been 15 years since and I, I get a lot of students um, with the reverse of my situation they come in with a more kind of classical um, you know Eurocentric kind of approach and I have, I don't cringe, but I, I, I because I know not to, because I know how that feels when you're a singer. Uh, but I, I kind of then give them the rundown of the conversation that I'm hoping to, to start uh, with, with you today. And so if you can give me your uh, abbreviated version of your journey, and then we can get into the conversation, that would be great. So <clears throat> my, my household was very unmusical in that music was a visitor 
it was only allowed in on weekends when my father would play a classical record. And this is my very early childhood. And so it was just a serious household. And I'm one of five, so it can't be too serious. You know, my, my brother and sister, we'd be goofing around and stuff, but there was no sing-alongs. There was no, uh, the radio wasn't playing music. It was, it was pretty stoic of a culture in my household. And one day I was six years old, a piano was delivered to the, you know, in the, what was a foyer just outside of our living room. And it was for my sister, older sister to take piano lessons. And this piano was, uh, was a playground to me. I just love the fact of you could put your fingers on it and make some sounds and you didn't get in trouble for doing so. Like you could, you could be pretty rambunctious on it as long as it sounded like something that was trying to be called music, uh, my parents would allow it. So it was this conduit of everything was pretty prim and proper. And if you played music, then you could go outside those boundaries. So I think I got, I got turned on by it. And this is back in the 60s. So there was a lot of variety. If, you, if anybody Googles the top 10 or you know, top 100 pop songs in the 60s, you'll hear this huge, you know, from, from Hendrix to the Beatles to Nancy Sinatra to Bing Crosby to Elvis to, it's like, and it was all on the same radio station. And so it was just this incredible variety of, of sounds. And so just my brother and I, you know, at very early age were sort of indoctrinated by this. He picked up a uh, violin as his instrument. Each one of us was told to learn a musical instrument to well round our education. And so I, I broke the code. My older sister took flute, piano with the other, my brother violin. I said drums. And so, so they were like, ah, okay, it's not really an instrument. <laughs> not, not legit. Not really music. <laughs> so, so it's like, I threw them a curveball. So they gave me one drum, a snare drum. And I was told if I took lessons, then I would be able to get, you know, each piece of a drum kit. Like we weren't well off. So it was like, I'd have to wait to Christmas and then wait for my birthday. And I just wanted a big drum set like the Who had, or, you know, some of the rock bands that were just coming up. Um, and so, so what I did was I put books around my snare drum to imitate the rest of the drum kit. And as I was beating on everything with sticks, my father would, and my mother both would be like, what are you doing? You're supposed to be playing the rudiments on your snare drum, you know? And I'm, <laughs> I'm playing the bed, bed posts and everything. So they just thought I was undisciplined and, and said, we're going to take the drum away if you don't practice your rudiments. And the rudiments just didn't speak to me. I, you know, of course, I was just raw talent and wanted to, wanted to get a band going. So, uh, so, so that it, it sort of began everything. Whereas I got, you know, two other pieces. I walked around my neighborhood telling everybody I was the world's greatest drummer. <laughs> and so, before I had a drum set. And so other kids had pieces of drum sets. So I convinced them all to make a community drum kit in my basement. And so I had three different, you know, friends of mine bring their drums over. We made this massive drum set. And then my brother got a small guitar amp and switched over to guitar. So we started the world's greatest band when I was, you know, how old was I? 12, 13? And <laughs> And from there, like we, the neighbor was a bass player. My brother and I had drums and guitar. And we're looking at each other like somebody needs to sing. <laughs> and so, of course, guys at that age are very shy and, you know, introverted. So I was like, I'm with my big brother. So I was always, you know, the, trying to be the cool one because I wanted to be included with his older friends. <laughs> and so I was like, I could sing. And, you know, I, I never had experienced it other than in fourth grade, maybe a chorus or, you know, a sing-along assembly we used to have. So now we're in our bedroom rehearsing and all I ever got from my father especially was, what is that racket? It was the typical generation gap of, and so, you know, the only comments were, that's not music, it's just pure noise. You're just screaming. 
and he was just uh, absolutely resistant to it all. Right. And so were the neighbors because they were all complaining because we're up, you know, they could hear us. Right. And and then my father and left the house and he divorced my mother. Right. So from that moment on, I'm 15. And what was, you know, me swimming against the current, kind of making, trying to make headway, but getting all this resistance, all of a sudden, my house went into chaos. And in that chaos, I took full advantage of it and said, you know, all right, I'm now I'm going to make a decision here, I'm going to be a musician, and started to go outside my brother's little circle and made my own friends and brought kids in and jammed, you know, that kind of stuff because things were very strict up until I was 15 and then the wheels came off. Mm -hmm. And so it was both scary for me emotionally, but also kind of uh, exciting at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, kind of the same story as yours. Uh, I, at 18, uh, finished high school, of course, and then got a job at a dry cleaner nearby because I didn't want to go to college. I wanted to be in a rock band. I auditioned for a band that had just gotten off the road with Kiss, which at that time they were the biggest band in the world. Right. They were opening for them. So I was just absolutely through the roof thinking like, this is it, I'm done. And quickly in that band where I was singing backup harmonies and playing drums, uh, we had our own house. We had you know quick trips into New York City to meet the record companies and stuff like that. Management, uh, everything was paid for. So it was literally, we got an allowance every month uh, you know, spending money. It was like, I'd gone to heaven. And that was a very short trip to heaven because many, <laughs> a few months later, the manager got thrown in jail for extortion. He was right. selling fraudulent tickets and, and the record company dropped and the sheriff came knocking at the door because the record company was not paying the mortgage on this house. So it, there was liens on it. So we just, we got thrown out of the house really uh i i went back to my mother and she said i can't take you back in because we have a rule in our family of once you're 18 you're either out on your own or you're in college mm -hmm. but i can't change that for you your brothers and sisters had the same rule mm -hmm. so i i put my tail between my legs and called my father and said okay i'll i'll take up your offer and go to college mm -hmm. so i went to uh i what is it applied to two different colleges I decided to go to the one that accepted me and and tried to f go in as a vocal major but was rejected just like you because i went in there and i screamed <laughs> my song <laughs> and as i was singing the the auditioner was wincing and just uh, it was like i was choking her <laughs> and so it was then switched to a percussion major so i quickly faked a, a timpani solo that I was supposed to be reading, but I had just learned it by memory real quick. Mm -hmm. And I got into the percussion department in this school. It was Trenton State College at the time, not a lofty, you know, touted school at all. Mm -hmm. And the point is, from that point on, I got in as a percussion major, but I really focused on the, you could take voice as a minor, I could take voice as a minor. And my instructor then just kept saying, you're never gonna be able to sing past your 30th birthday you're trashing your voice, you're, you know, everything is wrong, you have terrible technique. And then he would, of course, show me a, a bel canto uh, exercise or something. And I'd be like, but I don't want to make those sounds. And this is in the 70s now. So it was, it was not even entertained as an option. It was just, you're either going to ruin your voice, or you're going to sing correctly. Yeah. And, and that was the, the narrative back then. Yeah, uh, they wouldn't even acknowledge a band as tame as the Beatles, as being you know somewhat, somewhat eclectic. Mm -hmm. uh, this was again going way back, very stodgy. So it was just through that upbringing, I'm you know I'm out there in the clubs. I see what's going on in the rock and roll world. It was just so different than what the the academic environment was yeah. that I just made my head spin of like don't you realize what's going on out there? There's a, there's a change. And my professors back then who were my age now were just completely clueless with this emerging popular music that was coming up. Yeah. And, I, and I, I found that disingenuous. 
I didn't know that word then, but I just couldn't believe that they were so unaware of popular music. And they were sheltered, probably. But, but we know now that a lot of the curriculums in, in college and universities comes from that more European kind of lineage, right? Exactly. So you pick drums, and to me, when I think of Africa, I think of, of rhythm and drums and things like that. And then when I think of Europe, I think more of uh, violins and all of these string instruments that require this like very uh, refined kind of training and motor skills and things like that. But the point is, is that even though I personally as a child did not like the folk music of the Dominican Republic, I wasn't, it wasn't my favorite thing. It was people were responding to it and it was more rhythmic uh, and all of that stuff. So I have now students that I think that's what they want to do. But there's this that bias that I know you keep mentioning that this was back in the day, back in the day, but it's lingering. And there are these thoughts like I am not legitimate if I can't do this correctly. I need to do this with this approach. And so, sometimes I'm met with a little bit of um, doubt or skepticism when I'm saying this is a completely different kind of approach. And the way that I think of it is, is more that I, I don't mean this in a uh, negative way, but that the kind of singing that I enjoy doing and I respond to best, it's, it's more primitive, if that makes sense. It's more primal, primal. Thank you. More primal. It's about more like the emotion and the feeling. And in preparing for this conversation with you, I started to listen to the music I was listening to back when I was a kid that I responded well to. And what it all had in common was it's not necessarily that it's, you know, this extremely refined and finessed, you know, vocal delivery of like perfection. It's more that I, I feel like the singer is crying over something that they lost mm -hmm. and they can't find again or they're looking for. Or I feel like the singer is expressing a very human emotion and it sounds like like a person. So there's a lot of breathiness in all the singers I like. It's a lot of vocal fry in the singers that I like. Uh, and if I did that for my uh, teach, professor in college, she would wince. She would just be like, what are you doing? And so now um, I get singers here that either have studied with other teachers uh, before, and then they're creating these sounds and these you know, very specific postures and with these specific ideas of placing the tone and supporting the tone and raising the soft palate and placing it forward and all of these techniques, right? And I personally, that, that route never worked for me. So um, the reason why I wanna have the conversation is because I just wanna create awareness that, that really we're talking about two continents here. Uh, Exactly. And the thing is that was never explained to me, nor you, nor any of your students, was that for uh, the, the Eurocentric sound, which was developed back in 16, really 1500, there was an acoustic requirement. And that's what was never explained. I would have understood it then and said, oh, OK, not for me. Mm -hmm. But instead, like the word you just used, it was called legitimate. It was called correct. It was called healthy, right? right? And still to this day, these those biases are leaking in. Still used. Well, if you sing good technique, right? That's always these sort of coded language that a lot of people will use yeah. because there's a bias towards that sound. So back in the day, back in 1600, you had to project your voice over an orchestra unamplified. No electricity was harnessed yet, so no microphones. So there's a notch in the frequency spectrum of an orchestra. There's a dip right around 2,800 hertz. Most now, you know, studied singers, people that like the science of singing, they'll, they'll be familiar with those frequency spectrums. But 2,800 hertz was a coveted singer's ring. It was a cluster of overtones that give a natural boost or amplification to the voice right at the point where the orchestra had a dip. So then our brains fill in the rest. When we hear a little piece of a singer, our brains will go ahead and paste in the rest, just like it will do for vision. And so those singers got to move forward in the, in the hierarchy, if you will, of the choruses. Their voices were dramatic. Their voices were able to be heard. 
So what deemed you a singer back in 1600 was if you could fill a hall with the sound of your voice. What deems you a singer today in contemporary standards is if you can fill a hall with people, if they can relate, if they bond. And so all of the Afrocentric sounds we're talking about were all, you know, to me, in a, in a different resonator because it was all very intimate in terms of there was a gathering, a small gathering, if you will, or there was yells across the savanna. The communication of the cry, of that emotion, that's from earliest writings we can see before writing, that's how stories were transferred in song. And they would be very primitive songs, of course, but that's how cultures pass their history down. So mm -hmm. folk music, if you will, is, is how history was passed down, is how communications were made, is how th lessons were taught. And so that's to me why it's so deeply embedded in our DNA in terms of the response you have to a cry sound, mm -hmm. to a joy sound, to an anguish sound. Those are emotions that all humans share, but without the need of projecting it over an orchestra, now we don't have, we can use the whole bandwidth, if you will, right. in, in contemporary and, right. and in any cultured or in that refined bel canto style, there was just that acoustic requirement. Once I sort of studied into that and understood it better, I was allowed to like, you know, and, and really admire that singing and that skill set, if you will. But I take, I take great exception when people say it's higher skilled, it's more refined technique, because those African polyrhythms that you're talking about mm -hmm. are incredibly complex. Yeah. And, and I've yet to see someone well versed in, in a bel canto technique truly sing in a Afrocentric sound. They can't make that transition very much like the transition the other way. You can always, there's little tell signs in there. Yeah. And, and so it is both, I, I think, are highly skilled behaviors if you choose to pursue it to that level. Yes. And to put a hierarchy that one is more elite than the other is nothing but all the garbage that's coming to fruition in our lifetime now with, with history and with cultures to begin with. Yeah. Now the world has shrunk because of electronic media and we are all in each other's business and right. we are all culture sharing and appropriating. Mm -hmm. And so with this mixture of cultures now, sound has become... Uh, universal, if you will. Yeah. And with amplification, there's really no need to produce that narrow of a bandwidth, but yet it is a period specific sound. Right. So the defense for it is getting shallow and shallower because yeah. there, there's only one ampli unamplified house now that I know of, and that's Lincoln Center in New York City. It's the only yeah. one without, yeah. ampl without modifying the sound. Everybody else has some kind of stage miking or a wig mic going on. Yeah. So then you got to ask, okay, then why that sound? If if it was completely in the in the early days, that was really smart to be able to you know have the advantage to the singer to be heard. Um, it, it would be like having a horse whip in a car, just in case the car breaks down. It's like we've changed our modes of transportation, so we no longer use horses as transportation. Yeah. And, and so to set up our road system to accommodate horses would seem to be <laughs> unnecessary. Yeah. So so then this is, you know, something that I'm interested in expounding on, because, you know, I think that if the teacher uh, of the student, the voice teacher of the student isn't clear on these things and they're still kind of passing down these techniques or these suggestions, these approaches that are you know, to do the equivalent of putting a horse back on the, on the streets, um, then, you know, it, it may just not be a match. There are people that do want to do that. I have friends that do uh, sing there at the Lincoln Center and that's, they want to have a teacher that is actually, you know, doing that. That's, that's their specialty and that's what they, that's what they're going for. But then when you have a student that is responding more to these more primal and just uh, immediate and direct sounds like I don't think it's a coincidence that as a child you gravitated towards drones and not towards the violin. Of course, there's, you know, you're one of five, I'm one of five, too, and we each 
find that, but I think there's just something that resonated with you about that kind of rhythmic. And that's part of knowing yourself and understanding where you come from. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason why I went to college wanting to be kind of like a pop rock star because, and not a musical theater or an opera singer. Um, and then, you know, I ended up going there and, and because these adults are authorities and they look like they know what they're doing and they can read all this music and they can play this piano and I can't do that thing. I did kind of uh, submit to that and, and it was good because I grew and I learned from their world. And I, 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 was, I was willing to absorb kind of what they were teaching me. And I kind of uh, can, can perform a little bit like, like that, that style of singing that's more operatic, but that's not really what I ever set out to do. And then, you know, I was a bad boy and I looked for a voice teacher outside of college, which happened to be you. Um, I went online and this was before Google was the only search engine you could go on. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you showed up at the top with voicelesson.com. I, I went in, I met you, and I came into your studio with what they had taught me, which was the sound, this contrived kind of sound that you called me out on it. And then it was an instant connection with you because it, it felt like a match. I was like, this is what I'm looking for. And back in those days, I don't know how college campuses are now, they all were teaching more legit or legitimate styles of singing. And um, I felt so lucky to have found you. And, you know, I was in Long Island and you were in Boston. I know you had a studio in the city, but I didn't know about it back then. Mm -hmm. And I, I drove all these hours to go meet with you. And uh, I had this recording and I just kept referring back to it. And it was like my saving grace because I remember what happened to me was that taking in all that instruction that my uh, classical singers were giving me was killing the joy out of my singing. I was feeling like, this is not what I want. This is not what I set out to do. And so I just think it's important to know what kind of singing you want to do and to have this conversation or to just kind of discover what, what your teacher is trying to get you to achieve. Because the way I see it is my student, I am, in support of whatever sounds my student wants to make, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. The student is not in support of whatever sounds I want them to make. Yeah. Uh, and difference. that was how I felt in college. Big difference. I don't know if it, I hope it comes through when you replay this video, but there's a rainbow going right through you. <laughs> there's some reflection going on with the rainbow is going right through, right through your throat. It's awesome. <laughs> oh, I love that. It's, it's intersecting right there. There's two things I think are just paramount when explaining or or sort of like detailing the difference between these two musics, and that is empathy. That with the with a cultivated sound, there needs to be cognitive empathy. Whereas everything, because of the acoustic requirement in a classical uh, setting, there needs to be a certain sound that the singer is coveting. So therefore, joy, pain, sorrow, any of the emotional qualities all sound the same because of that acoustic requirement in order to project the voice. So that's called cognitive empathy because the book, the lyric has to tell the listener what that singer or character is experiencing. Mm -hmm. And on the other side of that coin is effective empathy, all the Afrocentric sounds, and that is the umbrella to me is all contemporary music comes so, under that heading. It is all effective empathy where the singing sounds like the sentiment. When those two match, when you're lonely, you sound lonely. When you're happy, you sound happy. Horny, you sound horny. Mm -hmm. Is why it's so easy to enjoy musics from other countries, from other cultures in that, under that umbrella, because whether somebody is Cuban or it doesn't matter the nationality or the language, I understand what they're feeling because their sound suggests to me, this guy's lonely, this woman is happy, this, you know, it's, and now it then just gets into rhythms and vowel sounds. And, and I can, I can love a song that I have no idea what it's about because the sentiment is being projected as the sound of the singer's voice. With that divide, I find that the lessons take on a very different nature. And that's where I'm always, querying people that come in for lessons with me and asking them what what their path is what they where they see themselves 
because if they are, you know, aspiring to go to Lincoln Center or do something like that, I, I will let them know that I don't think I'm the best match for that simply because it's going to be a lot of repertoire training as well. Wow. The classical singers I work with are clear that what I, the work that I do with them is more therapeutic. Yeah. It's more just muscle or training, getting, getting flexibility, getting agility in the mechanism itself. Wow. And I make sure when I work with them that I, I'm very cautious of not suggesting a sound, which I may do if I'm working with a Afrocentric singer that's sort of groping around for something and I think they're inhibited. So therefore I'll suggest a sound and kind of put the bait out there for them to come get it. Right. I won't do that with a classical singer. I would never insult them by trying to make a classic, what I think is a classical sound. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I know many, uh, I went through that period where I was going to voice teachers way back in the day and they would give me what they thought was a pop sound. And I was like, thank you, <laughs> thank you for trying, but that's not what I'm looking for. That's not what I'm after. Yeah. And that comes down to the art in articulation. So with formal articulation, because there was such an acoustic requirement on the vowel sound to project that one set of frequencies to around 2800 hertz, the articulation had to be very crisp and formal. And as you know, the, the relaxed articulation of all the Afrocentric musics make it a lot of times difficult to understand English and I speak English. Yeah. And so there's a lot of English songs that I don't know what they're about because <laughs> I can't understand the singer in terms of the language, but I definitely understand the emotion being portrayed. Yeah. And it's usually always what hooks me first, and then I go find out. Sometimes I'm disappointed. I don't, I don't like the lyrics, but Same. You know, the song got me first. And yeah. so articulation and empathy are huge divides there in terms of what makes a classical singer sound out of place when they sing something contemporary is that they're still articulating in a classical manner and they're still leaning on cognitive empathy to help the listener understand where they're coming from and they haven't immersed themselves in that they haven't allowed them that that switch over yes. so if, if somebody was going to be by genre i think that would be a, a, a necessary uh, understanding that they, it's more than just, you know, if somebody sings a pentatonic scale and they think that's soul, it, it's not. <laughs> it's just, that's insulting, just like, you know, singing with vibrato is classical. It's like, that's insulting. And so the idea here to me is to really be in those cultures is to switch empathies, is to switch articulations, and all the rest will trickle down from those two, what I think are major divides between those, you know, those continents, if you will. Yes, and I want to just uh, legitimize uh, contemporary Afrocentric singing for people because I do feel like, in general, you know, since a lot of pop singers are more, you know, they, they learn by, by sound and they may not read and they may not be have as extensive a training and they might not have extensive knowledge of all these languages and I think that you know the the contemporary singer is prone when they're kind of comparing themselves to a classical singer to feel inadequate and i know that was the case for me when i was younger i i don't feel that way anymore because i do feel that what i do is just as legit or legitimate as what they're doing it's just i think it's uh drawing from a different part of the brain and like you were saying about affective empathy and what was the other empathy? Cognitive empathy. Cognitive empathy. Part of the brain, middle of the brain. Right, yes. So you can be a master at, at the, eliciting that cognitive empathy, empathy or the effect of empathy. And you can just resonate or gravitate more towards wanting to do one more than the other. But I don't think there's a superiority or an inferiority to either. Absolutely. And yes, so, you know, because the, the whole academic uh, world is more uh, cognitive, it makes sense that there would be that feeling of supremacy in that whole world. But I just, I don't want singers to feel like because they can't read music or because they don't understand music theory, that they're any less of a musician or any less of a singer. And I also want to encourage them, you know, if, if there's there are those feelings to 
not be intimidated by it too, because I know for me, I was extremely intimidated by the little dots on the page and understanding rhythm and music. And, and also I had the fear, I think like a lot of, you know, effective empathy singers have, that if I enriched, enriched my cognitive abilities, that it was going to affect negatively right. my ability to, to reach, you know, an audience because it was going to be in the way or something like that. Yeah. And what I'm discovering now, I'm much older now than when I had these superstitions or these uh, beliefs, is that it's enriching my ability. And that's one thing that I want to do too, to bridge these two and to make them both legitimate and make them both good in, in, in this conversation so that it's not either or. And that's why I, I'm titling it um, Afrocentric singing and Eurocentric singing, not verses, because they're not they're not competing with each other. They're just that's great. Like you said, different parts of the brain. Well, you know, from in in my day, it was non classical singing. That's what any all the contemporary stuff was called. It wasn't even called contemporary because there was contemporary classical music. Mm -hmm. So the the genres were all non classical, and then uh, pop. In other words, so my snarky ass, I would say to my professor when they said, well, you're singing non-classical. I'd be like, no, I'm singing popular. And it's like, does that mean that classical is non-popular? <laughs> and of course I got a sneer for that. But the point is, it's, there's a lot of that code hidden in the language. And people today are very sensitive about language and yes. labeling, right? And so that wasn't the case in 60s and in the 70s, but it was it was permeated in all of the all of the you know like I had to learn singing especially anatomy through classical books which were very biased in in its in the language of literally it would get as close as if one sings in a cabaret one should be cautious of overusing the voice and like that kind of language it's like oh my god come up for breath and so so the point here is that that's it's you know over my lifetime it has gradually and it's been so gradual it's killing me uh -huh. but it's been gradually changing and gradually allowing a little mixture of language in there i agree with you 100 percent that now i have so much more respect for classical singing so much more respect for bel canto than i did as a 20 year old um because i was resistant then just simply because they weren't seeing me or acknowledging me so i i just had a uh, i had a uh, i had a protest against the word legit a protest against the word correct healthy i've been fighting that for 50 years those terms because they still leak in today of yep. people, people thinking well if you had good technique and when i would ask you know talk further down that uh, a lot of doctors still believe that there's a lot of ENTs still believe that a classical technique is the only sort of true way to put a singer on a more balanced path. Yeah. And I and I just think it's time for that to finally go away. Yeah, because these are just beliefs and, and they're not true. Um, yeah. And, and you know, they, they reside in the singer. And I feel like a lot of the work that you and I are doing is, you know, gently and gradually dispelling these beliefs. You know, and, and so that's the I know that the sensitivity about language can be annoying. I, I, I've been one of those that's always sensitive about language, and I know that it can be upsetting. And it's like, oh, get over the language. Let's just get to, to, mm -hmm. to business. But I think that there's something important about it. And so I'm kind of a part of me is happy about some of the sensitivity because I think it's important to be impeccable with our speech. Right. And so. And so that's that's the benefit of that. And so when we say, you know, that's legit singing or that's healthy singing or that's proper singing or that's good singing or that's the only singing that you can do that will not destroy your voice. Mm -hmm. Those are lies. They're lies because and it's evidenced by rock singers that have had careers forever and, and contemporary singers that have had careers forever. And on the flip side, there are classical singers who have had to shorten their careers because they've gotten into you yeah. know, vocal dysfunction. So it, they're not um, synonym. Classical doesn't mean healthy and, and right. contemporary doesn't mean unhealthy. They're just different. And like you were saying, they, they, they draw from different parts of the brain and we can get skilled at doing either. And we can do 
either with efficiency and, and, and balance or, or not. So yes, I yes. prefer those words to correct and incorrect. Uh, I also like the word intentional or unintentional. Um, and that's, that's like that. key. So all of the outside language, if you will, leaks into a singer's inner narrative. And that's where it becomes pernicious because if they're thinking what they're doing is illegitimate because they're not singing legitimately, then that illegitimate behavior is going to be synonymous with bracing and tension. There'll be an unconscious driver there of when they're reaching for a note, pulling chest is the common term, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. They're, they're literally bracing themselves knowing what I'm doing is about to do is bad. I know this because it's not that it's not what was told to be good. So they're purposely doing this stuff because they have a desire to sing this way. And I hear the word permanent damage so much. <laughs> and this is, uh, again, a holdover from the misuse of language. So I have to be very, uh, I'm educating people a lot just in their own internal narratives where those words are doing them a disservice. So it's not so much that we have to go around correcting people of like, don't call me illegitimate. It's like, I, I'm reminding singers, don't call yourself illegitimate. Yes. Don't, yes. don't say to yourself, this is bad that I'm singing this way. Either change it or change that narrative because that narrative is going to, is talking to your muscles the same way your desires are. Yes, yes. And really I just, yes. And, and briefly, I want to just go over some things and set the record straight on these ideas that are so pernicious in common. A lot of singers, when they come here, they think they have to stand up and I, I can tell them they can sit. And they're just like, what? I can sit? And I'm like, yeah, why not? Like, don't you see, don't you watch the, uh, gra what is it, the Grammys or all these award shows where singers sing sitting down? Um, and then they, they they take on this artificial posture and, and I go, you don't have to do that. And they go, well, what do you mean? That's what I always thought I had to do. And then I'll see them putting their hand on their stomach and I'm like, what's going on? I'm singing from my diaphragm. And you know, I particularly do not like that terminology. Most of the terminology that I resist naturally has its roots in the things that I was told by teachers that just complicated my singing more yeah. and did not work for me. So now, like you, I might still be kind of going through my process of like letting go of these kind of uh, vendettas that I have against these <laughs> languages because they, 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 they really took all the joy out of my singing for a significant amount of time, hmm. you know, makes me emotional saying it. And I feel that, you know, that, that could also be the case for other singers. So just dispelling a lot of these things that, uh, just making these sounds and these postures and i'm like you don't have to do that a lot of times they're shocked to hear me say that that's not necessary because there are all these stereotypes of what singing is or should be but again if you need to make that acoustically dominant uh, frequency then the column of air the energy that the breath you know is touted to be correct for singing it all makes sense so i i often just remind people what you're talking about is an unfinished phrase stand if you want to create that what's subglottic pressure if you want to create that tremendous subglottic pressure or apogee breathing if you're going to do that yes then standing would be an, an adva advantage to your to your breathing behavior if you're not then it's apples and oranges the breath in contemporary stuff is proportionate it is ongoing it's dynamic it it is facilitated by the by the sound, not the other way around. Yeah. And so it's just, I, I keep reminding people that I work with that finish that sentence. If you're going to sing opera, then you should stand, then you should do this, then you should do that. Absolutely true. And that, just put it this way, that would be the best practice. Yes. And if you're not going to sing opera, which doesn't seem like you're singing opera, then none of that matters. Like skating isn't necessary for golf, but both use clubs. And so there's a, there's a lot of similarities because it's both called singing, right. but there's so many dissimilarities that it needs to be spoken about yeah. and, and categorized in people's heads of like, oh, okay, that's a whole different set of behaviors. Right. Which is why when you go to the opera, the singers are standing, but then you go to see, you know, a more contemporary show and you'll see them sit, you'll see them stand, you'll see them run around, you'll see them lay, you'll see them do all these other things.
Phantom of the Opera, La Boheme, there's, there's moments in every opera where somebody is reclining or kneeling, right? And their voices are exactly the same. <laughs> and so when you get to a high skill level, yes, all postures, it, it becomes an internal versus external. But yes. for, for beginners, I understand there's a stacking up of, of behaviors. Yes. And that again is when the outcome is a particular sound, then that is warranted. You can literally put the puzzle together. But I always view Afrocentric as top down instead, whereas the sound will govern the behavior rather than the behavior governing the sound. Yes, great. So well said. That's my favorite thing about my conversations with you. It's, it's so uh, synthesized and simple. I know you've been teaching for a bit, so I know it, it takes yeah, a while. <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> yes. So uh, we got another uh, about five minutes. I, I just wanted to talk a little about the um, the way that, because I'm in, I went to school for musical theater and I have a big love for it. And I remember when I was in college for it, there were like two rock musicals. It was like Rent and uh, right. I don't remember something else, but. And now it's it's switched completely. So now the singing is very different and it's very microphone dominant, which is something we haven't really talked much about. It's, um, you mentioned something about pulling up chest, right? Which I think was more an issue, I don't know if it still is, back in the day when singers were trying to imitate the sounds of the contemporary singers of that time, like a Sinatra, he would pull up chest all the time and people wanted to do that. But now we got, all these singers are singing more in falsetto and in a lighter, what they call mixed voice and stuff like that. So that's not as much of an issue. I think now the instruction and, and the conversation uh, has to also change because I've noticed that a lot of teachers and books and things like that are trying to address that issue that was more a problem longer ago yeah, yeah. <laughs> so 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 one of the things that i'm very passionate about as a teacher i take very seriously is staying very current on like what the new wave of singers what their challenges are mm -hmm. and so i think this conversation might be a little dated because admittedly it's a little bit of therapy for myself and it's also because i get singers of different age groups with different ideas but the younger singers i think they understand this stuff more but it seems like there are some people are like it's opera dead like these things are dying and this new thing is emerging and so i just wanted to get your thoughts on that evolution that you feel we're going through with this more microphone centric singing it's, uh, and all that. it's beyond the microphone it's now the the it's bedroom pop it's now with a computer with a laptop uh, any 16 year old can take a USB microphone and whisper into it over tracks that they've, you know, mm -hmm. that they're looping and he become a superstar. <laughs> so, and so my point is that very uh, intimate form of singing uh, didn't go through the, the, the filter that I did of in nightclubs, night after night after night after night, mm -hmm. you know, projecting over a huge loud band, mm -hmm. you know, with bashing set. That's not the inroad anymore. It's digitized to the point where you can whisper over a, a slamming track if that's the way it's going to be. Mm -hmm. I have huge respect for the will of a Billie Eilish or or any of the contemporary, you know, the sort of she's the queen of the bedroom pop stuff. Mm -hmm. In that the the albums are literally recorded in a bedroom, mm -hmm. and and that intimacy then translates weirdly on an arena setting. So she's using the same voice that she used in a bedroom because the walls were right there, literally reflecting off, you know, in four feet away from her. And now she's in an arena. I My hat's off to her for be, having the willpower of, of emulating that same sound when your eyes are begging you to shout. Your mm -hmm. eyes are saying like, hey, you in the back, I can't hear you. Let's get out. Like, yeah. with all those singers, you know, run of, are, can you, all right, we're breaking up a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so in other words, they were I lost you. I lost you, uh, 
I lost you at that part when you said that you uh, admire Billy's will to remain that intimate when the, the space begs for you to. Yeah, so I, I work with lots of rock bands and really what kills their voice is their eyes. They're looking out at a big venue and, that, yes. and it's tilting their, their power feed. Yes. So they're overdriving the mechanism, looking into a balcony that's very far away and Billy Eilish doesn't do that. The in-ears have helped tremendously bring the sound, bring the whole experience much more closer, if you will. Back in the day when we had side fills and wedge monitors, they always sucked. And so you would, you would be in a fight with the stage volume all the time. Yeah. That's changed a lot. And so, but just the, 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 the I want to say this right, the generation, if you will, Every generation has their own sound, right? Every 10 years, it kind of evolves. And, and to me, what's so prominent now is just that very intimate voice over a slamming track. And so it's a real dichotomy there that's, that's new for me, but I think it was born out of the necessity of, I'm singing in a small room, I'm just inventing this music now, because all the music is digital, uh, now you can create the sound of some slamming drums and and big noisy music and just go like I don't know why you sing sing yeah. very gently and now we're listening to music differently a lot of us are yeah have it in here and so we like that whispering into our ear kind of feel exactly so technology has led the singer instead of singers leading technology. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's not always true because uh, I think some of us are stubborn, like myself, and uh, <laughs> I'm like, no, I will not be led by technology. I will be led by my heart and my primal instincts, and that's how I will say <laughs> And so, yeah. So that's the round. That, to me, is the evolution. It's everybody, every generation is looking for their own signature sound, right? Mm -hmm. And it's usually a mix of circumstances. We've got a generation coming up with a pandemic now and all that that isolation did to them. We won't know that ramification for another five, 10 years, right? Yeah. Of, uh, and so, so we'll see what that, how that bears out musically, but it is, it's fascinating to me because it's still the same primal instinct of bonding through sound. Yes. And that's both a self loop, right? And then the loop that goes out to the listener and that power feed, once that connects, is the same as as our ancestors experienced uh, yes. banging on tree trunks and yes. and calling across the savanna. So that part hasn't changed, and I yes. you know, I love that spiritual connection. Yes, agree. Well, I know we both have to go uh, teach now, but I've enjoyed so much this conversation. It's always a pleasure. I thank you so much, and hopefully this is helpful to singers out there. I hope and, so. Uh, I'm going to link to your uh, page and channel in the comments and uh, people can learn more about you there and um, have a great day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. <laughs>